Welcome to the Night of Hope Against Heroin. This is going to be a great event filled with singers, speakers, testimonials, all to the glory of God with the message that the chains can be broken, addiction can be set free, and God is the victor in all of it. We kick off our evening with a great singing group, City of Bright, with one of their own original songs. I can tell you it doesn't matter where you've been Only matters where it's taken you It's all brand new Believe it You've been crushed and broken hearted But he calls you beloved You know it's true your past has gone away it's in a mercy every day mountains moving everything renewing with a new breath in your lungs a reset restart now get up and always pray and run this race he will be the strength inside you Hold fast to what he's promised Cause you know how great his love is And he gave it all for you So reset, restart He's giving you a new heart Because your past has gone away Tender mercy every day Mountains moving Everything renewing With a new breath in your lungs A reset Believe it Receive it Now live it Reset, restart He's given you will be back with us a little bit later to share another song with us. But you know, as we think about the battle against drugs, the battle against heroin, the battle against addiction, think about all of the different agencies and organizations that are involved. And yet, when we can put God at the forefront, it is wonderful to see the great things that can happen. We welcome now to the stage, Kenton Mayor, Randy Manns. Thank you. Good evening. I just want to take a moment to share a, a, actually an awesome experience I had last week in Kenton at the drug court. Um, we had a gentleman who had just graduated and uh, he attends one of the uh, churches there in Kenton. And of course he uh, got to give his testimony at the end since he was uh, graduating. And for the next 20 minutes, that, and that was the first uh, drug court uh, session I'd been to. Um, and for the next 20 min minutes, he gave a testimony about God and his church. And he did throw his wife in there at the end. <laughs> Those are three important uh, things to uh, make sure we have a priority in our lives. But I have talked with the judges. We have awesome judges in Kenton. And uh, I watched how they interacted. But, you know, they come up with a, they were talking about their success rate. And they come up with a conclusion that the highest percentage it was like 90 some percent of the individuals that were successful in their programs had two things in common one was god and the second was church and and i agree now just really quick as, a, as a, my own personal testimony 12 years old i started drinking doing drugs and up until the age 21 but you know it it took god it took church and definitely a praying mother and on in my case so uh, again I'm gonna keep this very short which is probably the first miracle we're gonna see tonight and um, 
I, 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 but I do believe that anyone that's addicted, and, and it's such a, it's almost like playing Russian roulette anymore. It's a lot worse when, you know, drugs now than when it was when I was a teenager. Uh, fentanyl is involved. I talked with the uh, head of the, our, our task force, and he said everything that he had collected and, and confiscated in 2018 had a trace of fentanyl. Now, now just think about that, fentanyl, even in weed. I, I mean, every time you, you know, oh, I'm just gonna smoke a joint, or I'm just gonna do this, or try this, or, uh, no, no, you, you're actually putting your life on the line every time, so there is hope, and the hope, it, I, I believe, is God. It's, that's, a, that's a good place to give God a good hand. <laughs> and church, I, I'm a firm believer in church. and definitely prayer. Let's give God a hand, thank you. God, church, a praying mother, maybe a praying stepmother, maybe two little sisters that'll call someone up and say, hey, will you come to church? I had an opportunity a couple weeks ago to interview three incredibly inspiring people and all of them are sitting in our audience tonight. And I walked away from these interviews so amazed at the strength that I saw in these individuals. So I'm really excited right now to share with you the story of Josh and Nikki Meeker from bleak past to a wonderful present and an incredible future. My name is Josh Meeker. I'm 39 years old. I'm born and raised in St. Mary's, now I reside in Salina. Um, I guess it all started pretty much when I was one. Um, my parents uh, split up and my mom didn't want me. And I didn't realize it at the time, but my dad just took me and had an off and on relationship with my mom until I was about 13 probably. And then I got more of a better relationship about the age of 12, 13, I started drinking alcohol, smoking marijuana. Uh, probably last, that lasted probably until I was 16. And then I turned to the harder drugs, started doing cocaine, LSD, uh, anything I get my hands on pretty much. Well, that all took a back seat when I was 17 and I injected heroin for the first time. It was, I thought I found my purpose in life. It was the best, feeling I've ever had. Um, I couldn't, I just, I couldn't get enough of it. And this was at 17, I was still in high school. And no sooner than I graduated high school, I committed my, a felony. I broke into a drug dealer's house where I could have my drugs. And you know, I ended up getting caught and I went and did three years in prison for that. As soon as pretty much I got released off probation, it was, I put myself in front of my family and I started partying again. I started off doing cocaine all the time. And then shortly thereafter, it was right back into the heroin. Uh, my wife at the time, Amanda, she got custody of, of the girls. Uh, I went back to prison for possession of heroin. So it was just every time I would get out, I'd just run back to the drugs. And it was just a nonstop vicious cycle. And it made me a person that, who I really wasn't. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I consider myself a pretty nice person for the most part, and I was robbing people, I was stealing, lying. I, I, I mean, I don't care who you were. It was anything I could do to feed my addiction, I did. Well, when I met Josh, I was, I was addicted to heroin. Um, I was trying at that point to be clean so he was clean, so I thought it was a good idea, you know. So we, we were hanging out for a little bit and he, was, he had tips on how I could feel better when I was getting clean because it's horrible pain and suffering. Um, and then, you know, I did get clean and I was clean for a couple weeks. And then you get this thought in your head, well, might as well just do a little bit, you know, because I can handle it now. You know, well, a little bit turned into a lot, and then his dad died, and it was just completely out of control. 
come to find out, he had left an insurance policy in my name for $25,000, and that was going in 30 day, or 60 days. It was just blew through and drugs. We were smoking crack, and we were doing heroin, and just anything that we could possibly get our hands on, and a lot of it, massive amounts, just stuff, you know, people would say, oh, that's enough that would kill a horse. Yeah, that's, that's what we were doing. And um, we went on like that for a long time. And then my, my stepmother, she started praying for us. As I sat on those pews, the Word of God began to soak into my life and my heart and my spirit. You know, my body was drugged up, but my spirit was there and it was alive and, and it was soaking up every word of God. And she was going to church and she come home once one day and she's like, you know, it's over, I'm getting clean. My, my family asked me to the altar and I went and I gave my life to the Lord and he cleansed me that very moment. Like, he took it all out. Like, I was sick, but it wasn't as bad as it had been before. After about eight or nine months, I relapsed. And I was, was running, hiding from her, and you know, just sneaking behind her back, saying I'm going to work, getting drugs, going to work, and then we work early to get drugs. It was just, you know, everything revolved around the drugs again. And she come home one night and she said, oh, I'm done, I'm not living like this no more. And she packed up and left. You know, I was praying to the Lord because, you know, I knew. It was like the Holy Spirit in me knew that he was lying and that I had to move and do something about this. Or you don't ever know what could have happened. He could have died. You know, and if I was disobedient to the Spirit, when God told me, you know, if you want me to fix him, if you want me to save this, then you need to get out of my way and let me be God. For 30 more days, I kept at it. You know, it was like, all right, cool, I'm single now. You know, I can do what I really want to do now. And it just got to a point where it was, I don't know, I just had enough. About a month later, I got a call from Josh and he said he was ready to go to the refuge after we showed him the flyers and it took him a while to come around but it was answered prayer because it was constant i was going to church sunday morning sunday night wednesday tuesday and i was it was never ceased i just kept pushing forward and just claiming my life back because i'd had enough of the devil stealing from me stealing my joy my time my energy just my peace and everything and my my, my boyfriend you know, and I, I just remained faithful and trusted the Lord, even though everything looked completely a mess. Usually my withdrawals were, were horrible, like horrible. And I was not looking forward to going through that. And like there was 20 guys at this house and you know, they, they got around me, prayed over me and stuff like that. And this was on a Monday and Thursday. Usually I was down for a week to 10 days if I was sick withdrawing. And Thursday I was out playing football with the guys. And, you know, I, I wasn't 100%, but I wasn't like I was. And they were like, all right, maybe, maybe there's something to this guy up thing. So, you know, I got real close with an individual and I'm still close with him today. And it was, I just opened up to him, you know, he, he talked to me about God and who he was and, you know, and everything just, you know, just showed me who he was and I just gave it to, you know, it was November 2nd, 2015 and I just, I gave it to God. I said, you know what, I'm done. I can't, when I got control of this boat, I like, you know, it's, I crash it. I take control, you know, I'll do whatever you want me to do. We lived apart when he came home. I, I wouldn't allow us to live together. You know, I'm like, nope, we're staying apart until we're married and husband and wife. We're not living together. Even though we lived in sin for that whole time, we, you know, 
it says to repent and turn from your wicked ways. So that's what we were doing. <laughs> Whether he was on board or not, he had to better get on board. <laughs> so um, we got married on March 20th and it's been three years. It's been awesome. Our wedding theme is Ephesians 3.20 and that is God can do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ever ask, think, or imagine according to his power at work within us. So that's our promise, that's our wedding promise, and that's what we stand on. Well, while I was at the refuge, I was going out and helping homeless ministries. Uh, feed the homeless in Columbus and it was just I loved doing it I couldn't get enough of it and so like God just put it on my heart one day he's like you're going to do this in your area and he gave me the name for a ministry called Make Me Whole Ministries so that's kind of where we're at today uh, God has just totally totally changed my life um, I got custody of my daughter I got a good job I got a I could pay my bills, you know, just, he's restored everything. I mean, more than I ever expected. If anybody's struggling, you know, and listening to that, listening to that voice inside that says you, you're, nobody cares or there's no way out, Jesus cares. And, and he is the only way out. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So, give it a shot. Watch what he can do. <laughs> incredible, incredible testimony. I mean, how is that for a testimony? You saw at the beginning the darkness, the difficulty, and then at the end, the glory that God has done. Um, just, it's amazing. Our next speaker for tonight's event is Sheriff Jeff Gray from Mercer County. Thank you. I'm excited to be here, and uh, I appreciate Ben and Missy always inviting me to be a part of their, their night of hope that they do back in our county and this here tonight. As you could see from this uh, latest testimony here, we can't give up. We can't give up on people. You know, my, my job is to help people and to be there. And I'll tell you, being sheriff is a very unique job because we're the only people in the criminal justice system that are involved from the very beginning to the very end. We have people that are out doing the investigations, we make arrests, we hold them in our jails, and then if, when the judge is, is done and pronounces a sentence, we see to it that the sentence is carried out. Um, and I'll tell you the other things about being sheriff there there is the tough part of being sheriff is looking into a mother's eyes and telling them their child is not coming back whether it's from a traffic crash whether it's from a drug overdose and we've seen too much not just in Mercer County but across the United States across the state of Ohio we've seen too many people die of drug overdoses I think sometimes they give up hope, their families give up hope, and um, we, we've got to give the people who are suffering from addiction hope. When we first built our new jail and moved into it in 2010, we were starting to see the opiate problem starting to come in Mercer County. We were struggling with it because it's a small county, and who would have thought we would have the problems the cities have? And I remember I got a confession to make. I would walk back through the jail after we arrested people that were high, and they'd be going through withdrawal. And I'd kind of walk through and go, well, that'll teach them. They won't do that again. And then they'd be in jail long enough where they would get through the withdrawal. They would start feeling better. They would start acting normal. And I come to realize pretty good people, pretty smart people, just like the rest of us. And um, 
as I thought, well, they're going to get out of jail now. We've got them through their addiction. They're going to be fine. Well, they'd get out, and a few weeks later, they'd be back, and I couldn't understand it. So I started going back and talking to some of them and going, what's going on? They all have a different story for how they got, how they got addicted. Some of them, it wasn't their fault. Some of them went to the doctor because they were injured and they couldn't handle the opiates that were prescribed. Some of them made a bad decision, but which one of us has never made a bad decision in our life? Some of them by peer pressure. So as I got to talking, I started realizing, okay, this isn't something somebody's gonna get out of bed tomorrow. At least most people won't get out of bed tomorrow and go, okay, I'm not gonna do this again. We started bringing programs into the jail brought counselors into the jail, we brought faith-based programs into the jail, and we started trying to do things to work with the inmates and try to help them. And um, one of the things that I found, just like the mayor said from Kenton, the ones that I find that manage to, to I won't say beat the addiction, but manage to manage it and to stay clean for a period of time. And when I say a period of time, I mean two years, two and a half years, three years. Every one of them, when I see them, they have a faith in God. They have a faith in Jesus. They're talking about their church. It's amazing how they talk about their church and that relationship. And I think it's just very, very important that we recognize that and that any of the people that hear this, I want to play this tape in my jail once it's done. And anybody that hears this, hopefully they realize we haven't given up on them and there is hope and that hope is Jesus Christ. Thank you. like a map you had it all planned out you had it all together till it fell apart again oh, 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 oh. you're never too far gone oh, oh, oh you're never too far gone you're never too far gone oh, oh, oh you're never too far gone
You're never too far gone, City of Bright. That message is so important. You know, when God has changed your life and you are willing to tell others, then others' lives can be changed as well. And I'm excited to introduce you to Tim Shadley. Hello, I'm Tim and I am a recovering addict. Um, I'd like to show some gratitude to my dear friend Ben Booty for uh, asking me to be a part of this. And I definitely need to show some gratitude to God for you know, giving, blessing me with the ability to be here. Um, so I, I believe that I suffer from a disease of addiction which causes me to deal with obsession and compulsion. And I was able to identify the fact that I used to act out on this uh, before I ever even picked up uh, through attention seeking. And uh, then, you know, when I was 12 years old, I picked up for the first time. And um, I ended up spending 22 years in active addiction. Uh, you know, I don't like to share a whole lot about, you know, my years in active addiction. I think that's carrying more of the mess than carrying the message. Um, but, I, but I do, you know, like to share about, there was, you know, like the last five years in active addiction, um, there was some, you know, pretty life altering events that happened to me that, you know, shaped me into the person that I am today. And um, <clears throat> see, uh, you know, about five years ago, I uh, was, was charged with uh, trafficking and possession of heroin and uh, shortly after that, um, my, one of my best friends and my co-defendant on that case, he ended up dying of a drug overdose. And um, then a couple years after that, uh, my, me and my ex-wife, uh, you know, she was pregnant and she went into premature labor and our, our daughter passed away, uh, you know, moments after birth. And, and that had, you know, had to do with, with our, our use. And um, then a couple years after that, I had a significant other who overdosed and died. Um, so, you know, those, those things really drove me to a point of despair. And then not long after that, I was already on probation for, you know, the trafficking case and was charged then with burglary and was looking at uh, doing a couple years in prison. And um, so, you know, after all of that, it wasn't even so much the prison bid that I was looking at. It was, it was more of the, 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 just the despair that it came from all the lives that were lost uh, from my using. And um, so when, when I was in the county jail, I, uh, I hit my knees and, and I gave it over to God. Uh, you know, I would like, I also need to mention that, you know, those 22 years that I spent out there in active addiction, I spent as an atheist. And, um, you know, I was able to give it all over to God in, in, that, in that jail cell. And God then led me to 12-step to recovery. And 12-step recovery then taught, you know, a drug-addicted atheist like me how to build a relationship with God. And, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard for some people, you know, that, you know, came up like me to, to go to church and to reach out, you know, like that. So 12-step um, recovery ended up being uh, just, just such a life-changing thing for me. Um, you know, there's, there's many methods of recovery. Uh, I just know what works for me. Um, you know, if, if, if you know anyone or if you are a person that is struggling uh, from addiction, please just reach out to someone. The help, the help is there. Reach out to God. God will guide you and, and, and fellowship with other people. There are many people that are recovering from addiction that, that are willing to give help. So if, if you're suffering, reach out. It's there. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. You know, it is not easy to stand up in front of a crowd and speak about things that you're not proud about in your life. But yet God 
sends it as far as the east is from the west and says it's over, it's gone, it's a new life moving forward. And that doesn't mean life is easy every step of the way. Our flesh still wants to go back into those old habits, but yet with God, all things are possible. And let's just let's give another round of applause for Tim for being willing to step out. Um, and I wondered if you and you at home, would you be willing to commit to, let's pray for Tim. Let's pray for Josh and Nikki. Let's pray for Brad, who you're going to meet in just a moment. Others that you know who have walked this path and are breaking the chains and want to stay broken. And Lord, I, I just pray right now, Lord, that you would just continue to break chains, break all of these chains. We know that you are stronger than addiction. And even as this, this live show is going on right now, God, we just ask for your guidance and direction. Um, for those of you at home, there are some resources that we are showing on the screen. Those are phone numbers that you can call to get help, to ask questions. Uh, it is never too late. It is never, ever too late. In fact, it is never even too late, even if you've overdosed several times. God can bring you back, and God can have a future for you. And that's what you're going to see with this story from Brad Crouch. That's 15 about the time I stopped believing in God. Uh, that's when I first did my first line of cocaine and fell in love with it and kept doing that and end up leading to doing pills and uh, meth and during most of my 20s was doing about anything and everything that can catch me a buzz. Went through my divorce and it was a real messy divorce and everything. and. Um, I needed something to bring me down because I was getting all pissed off all the time. And heroin I knew would work. So I just picked up a needle and just started shooting. And kept on doing it for a couple of years until all our friends ended up going to prison. Ended up picking it back up and uh, kept on doing it for a few more years and ended up overdosing June 23rd of 2017. Um, body was on the floor in the bathroom about 5.30 that night when I got home from work. And my wife ended up finding me when she got home from work about 11.30. And my temperature was 90.7 degrees and my legs was swelled up because my kidneys shut down and released all the toxins into my legs. And they had to do relief cuts on my legs and my upper thigh and my right side. And had to learn how to walk again. Was in intensive rehab for a couple weeks and everything and got out of the hospital August 14th of that year and um, kept shooting up for a couple years after that, about a year after that. And then uh, went to that night of hope in St. Mary's at the end of July and ended up getting saved. We ended up selling our trailer in Jackson Center and I moved in with my mom and she moved in with her mom and everything and um, the last time I overdosed that was I was done and because I cheated death three times and knew that I probably ain't got another shot left so just kind of stuck to my groups and my Bible studies and going to church and everything. Monday nights I go to an AA meeting in St. Mary's and um, Tuesday nights I go with my dad to his Bible study. Wednesday nights I go to my church for my Bible study. Uh, Thursdays at noon I go to an AA meeting in St. Mary's and um, from five to six I go to Coleman's for group in St. Mary's. It's drug counseling there and on Fridays, days I have my laundry day, and Saturdays I just lounge around, and some days I go to church, and just getting that routine of having something to do every day kind of like motivates me to, you know, just stay in the habit and staying away from 75, staying away from Dayton. You know, those are two big triggers. Because looking back, you know, from the time I stopped believing to the time I got saved again, my life was just nothing but chaos, and I was always angry all the time, and just everything was just out of control. Even though I thought I could manage, you know, I, I was still able to work, so in a way I was like a functioning addict, 
So I thought I had a control of everything, but I didn't, you know, control is just an illusion. And, but now if I ever have a problem, I just turn it over to him and I actually have peace now, which is a very nice feeling. Peace in Jesus, that's right. Peace in Jesus, true peace is found through him. You are a child of God. You do not have to be a slave to fear. Jesus can break the chains of addictions. He can break the chains of anything in your life, no matter how far back it has gone. Jesus is stronger. Well, we have something special for you tonight. If you'd like to be one of the first 10 callers to call, you may receive a copy of this book at no charge, War, A Good Warfare, Fighting the Battles Within by Benjamin Booty telling the story of his own dealings with addiction and breaking the chains and how Jesus has not only set him free, but can also set you free. And here he is, Benjamin Booty. Well, thank you. Um, thank you so much. I just want to start out with prayer. God, I just thank you for this opportunity that you're preparing our hearts and our minds, God, to receive what you have for us today. God, I thank you that you are the one that heals and delivers. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. The fear of man brings a snare, but whosoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Proverbs 29, verse 25. The fear of man brings a snare. And that's what happened to me in my life. The fear of failure, the fear of not being accepted and not fitting in. I grew up in a little town called Maria Stein, the youngest out of eight kids. And I uh, compared myself to my brothers, how good they were at doing things. And for me, not so much. Uh, I remember one story when we, uh, I had the job of washing a car. So I got the floor brush out and I, and I scrubbed the hood of the car. And needless to say, it wasn't very shiny anymore. So it seemed like car de detailing was uh, out of the question for me. So somewhere along the line, I found music when life got messy. I loved how music made me feel. So I just got involved in music. When I was about 15 years old, I started playing music. Um, and, it, and I just, it just was, you know, it was, I felt that was gonna be my ticket to fit in. That was my ticket to be somebody, to be accepted in my life was to play music. I just thought that would be it. So I started playing in church about when I was 16 and started partying at the same time. If we were all the same reasons, just to fit in, just to be part of something, to be involved in, in, in people's lives. And uh, um, I was so influenced with the music. Um, I thought, uh, you know, their party lifestyle was what I needed to do to write songs. So I just, you know, I thought that's what I did as a rock and roll, and I started going down that slippery slide, and I started playing in bars when I was 18 and 19. And, uh, you know, so we got our beer for free and our drugs for free, you know, and chicks for free if you want to go into that song. That was the, the lifestyle, you know, of wanting to be accepted. And, oh, this is cool. This is, this, is, this is working. This is what, you know, I thought would, would, would make me feel loved. I had hope in my music. I had faith in it that it would bring me there. And... Uh, and, and um, um, then, then one Christmas day, this is, this is really stopped me in my tracks. Mom told me that she had cancer on Christmas day. And uh, I didn't know how to, to handle it. I wasn't very good at communicating. I wasn't very good at talking. Just doing this is, is a miracle in my eyes for what God can do to somebody. You know, and, 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 and so I wasn't good at communicating. I think that's why I like songwriting, so I could write things out because I didn't know how to talk. I think I talked to my mom two times when she had cancer, and she was at her house. She was on hospice, and she died nine months later, and I felt like something a part of me died also with my mom. So, so now I was careless, didn't fit in and careless, so it didn't matter what, what drugs I did. It didn't matter what I, what I did. The day of the funeral, I got some whiskey and some drugs, and I never looked back, and that was my lifestyle for 10 years, and we had some good success, or mild success, however you want to look, look about it. We opened up for some bigger bands. Um, you know, we, we played bigger shows. But that wasn't good for me. I, I would get too wasted. I was so nervous. I'd fall off the stage sometimes. You know, I'd just be so high using morphine. I'd just go into morphine, you know, use some drugs, and, and I'd drink like a fish. Always drinking. Drinking and drugging 
whatever you got. It didn't really matter. I just wanted to party, and it got to the point where it was just about the party, and it wasn't about the music anymore. You know, the music kind of set me free from my fear, you know, and, it, and, it, and, it, and then, the, then, it, then it was the drugs was setting me free, and it was about the drugs. It was about the party, and, and my life just, just went a mess, and it was like I hit a, hit a wall, and I lost everything that I had. I, uh, I had a good job, lost it, the place I lived in. I got kicked out. Uh, the band I was in, it was, it was done. So the things that I thought that was going to make me fit in and make my, my family proud or make people proud of me left me empty. It didn't bring the love that I was looking for. It was lost in what I thought that I should do to, 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 to get that through the music. And it's just amazing. I called my friend, Missy, uh, um, told her I was sick, and what was amazing about that, I, I dated Missy for six, six years prior, and I hadn't talked to her for like three years. I seen her at my friend's funeral, and, uh, and, uh, and I wasn't kind to her. I, you know, I, I was unfaithful to her. For her to even take my phone call was a blessing. You know, and I told her I was sick, and she just shared uh, Jesus had a plan and purpose for my life. You know, and it started, I was so paranoid and so lost and so confused. I mean, I literally couldn't sleep when I hit that broke wall, brick wall, as I'd say. I mean, I had to black out to fall asleep. I could not find rest. I was so paranoid. My, my friends had bars. They would let me lay on the, on the, on the porch or they put me in the house, but they would just lay me on my, on my stomach. I only had a couch in the place I was at with the green tubbleware. So didn't. It was just a mess. And she knew where I was at. She knew I was sick. And she just shared hope. And like I said, she didn't really have to talk to me. And she kept just sh saying how much Jesus cares and how much the purpose and plan that he has for your life. And I took heed. And I listened. And the amazing thing is through that green tub that just had junk in it, I thought, was my mom's Bible. You know, and I started reading in Proverbs because that's just what dad would do when we were little. He'd read Proverbs to us. And, and so I, I got to the verse, Proverbs 4, 19. It says, the way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. And I said, that is me. That's when I fell on my knees. I'm that wicked guy that can't rest, that I got to do something crazy. I got to act out. I got to do all this stuff. I'm this selfish person. And, I, and I'm, I'm that wicked guy. I, can't, I don't know what I'm tripping on. I don't know what I'm doing. And, 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 and I just said, Jesus, just forgive me for everything that I've done. Everything I said to you, God, I, 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 I hated God. I didn't want nothing to do with God through that point in my life. And I confess that I'm sorry, God, for the way I felt towards you. And God, I, I ask you to forgive me for what I said to my parents, what I said to my brothers and sisters, to friends, to people I don't even know. I asked God to forgive me. Jesus, forgive me. And you know what he did? He forgave me. He forgave me. Forgive Jesus the hand. And, he, and, and that's what we're here today, just to know that Jesus will forgive you. It doesn't matter how far or how long you've gone. That's what the cross is about. He died the terrible death that anybody can die just to show that it doesn't matter how far you've gone. He'll reach down. He'll bring you home. You're his children. You're his kids. He loves you. He loves you. And all you got to do is cry out to him. He says it in the word of God. You cry out to Jesus, and he saves you. He saves you. So if you're here in the audience or you're watching, just cry out to Jesus. You might be going to church. You might be hopeless. You might not even deal with addiction. But he'll give you that hope. Just cry out to him. Just cry out to him. We can pray, and, we, and if you want to pray with me, you can. And you, you just receive what Jesus has for you. Walk into your Father's arm, your Heavenly Father. And when that verse said, when I first read, he says, they that trust in him will be safe, and he'll make you safe. He'll give you peace. You won't have to run anymore. You won't feel like you failed anymore. Just be faithful to him, and he'll be faithful to you. Just pray in Jesus' name. We just loose your Holy Spirit, God. If anybody's feeling the tug in their heart, God, I thank you, Father God, that you open that, that they open themselves up to receive what you're trying to speak to them right now in this moment. Today is the day. 
you might not have tomorrow. Whatever you're facing, you might not feel like you can get out of it, but I guarantee you, if you cry out, he will break it off of you. Just let him be who he says he is. Don't judge him. Let him love you. When you want to pray, you say, Jesus, I ask you to be the Lord of my life. I ask you into my heart. Make it anew. I ask you to turn from my ways and ask you to give me strength to turn to your ways. I repent and give my life to you, Jesus. And now you said I'm saved. You've prayed that prayer. That's it. Get in that Bible and ask God for direction and he'll give it. He'll give you hope. He'll give you love. He'll give you something to believe in just seek after him we have numbers that we're going on you can call out if you make the commitment to Jesus you you want to make this journey and if you've prayed that before and you rededicated yourself to Jesus call and talk and if anybody here today in the audience want to talk and pray and made that commitment we're here I'm here me and my wife are here just talk to someone let someone know what you did and be excited we're rejoicing with you it says when you do that, you move the hand of God that you wrote, that he wrote your name in the Lamb Book of Life. And we just thank you for it. Just thank you. I just th- want to thank you for watching. I want to thank you for everybody for being here and just sharing your heart and know that Jesus can change and bring you hope. And we just thank you for it. We want to thank all of the individuals who were here with us tonight. And if you would like to rewatch those video testimonies that we shared, we, uh, you can just go to our website, WTLW.com, and we, you can watch those over and over again. In fact, you can share this program with your friends. You can find it on our YouTube channel, and you can also find it on our website. Now, we want to leave you with a gift, as I mentioned earlier. We have 10 copies of this book written by Benjamin Booty, and all you have to do to receive one is give us a call. Call 419-339-4444. You're going to get our voicemail because our receptionist isn't working at this moment, but just leave your name, your phone number, and your address, and we will send you a copy of this book. It's for the first 10. Don't forget, there is always hope. In the darkness of your night, there is always hope. If it feels dark at night, the Bible says joy will come in the morning. Joy is in the Lord, and we can always celebrate with him.